welcome to this wonderful, wonderful workshop webinar. And we are so happy to have Tatiana and Cynthia with us. And uh, we are happy to see you uh, today with us. So um, we are the TESOL Bilingual Multilingual Special Interest SIG. And we are so honored to have this today. So well, because we're a little bit late, let's get started, everyone. So Cynthia, you can, you can share, right? Yes. OK. Great. And while Cynthia is starting, I'll, I'll, I'll just go ahead and jump right in and say thank you, everyone, for being here. I know those of us in academia, it's like the last week of the semester and a very stressful time. So we're glad you could be here. And I think it's being recorded so we can share this with others as well. So. We're really excited to be here. Um, Clara, thank you for inviting us. It's really, um, we're so excited to share some of the work and the resources of CUNY-I, um, the CUNY Initiative on Immigration and Education, um, specifically because um, in TESOL and in bilingual ed, we often talk a lot about language, right? And then we talk about culture and um, some, to a lesser extent, I think we talk about race, but often immigration is not a subject that we talk about explicitly in these spaces. So we're really excited to, um, to have this conversation together. And we're gonna try to make time at the end um, for conversation, because I think that's, that's where the exciting part happens. So I'm just gonna jump right in and we'll go to the next slide. Mm -hmm. And we are going to um, introduce ourselves instead of reading our bios. I was at a talk with um, Yolanda Sili Ruiz and um, Goldie Mohammed, where they introduced each other. And I thought it was such a humanizing way of, um, you know, sharing who you are, and especially when you work in collaborative spaces like Cynthia and I do. So we are two members of a larger leadership team at CUNY-I. So I'm going to start and introduce Cynthia. Um, I only met Cynthia when we were interviewing her and for this position, and we kind of knew right away that this is the perfect person for this position and we need her for CUNY I and I thankful every day that she is here with us Cynthia is um, comes to the to this work, not only with personal experience around migration um, migration crossing international borders, migration crossing national borders, um, but also from her professional world is in doing her doctorate at the University of Arizona around um, immigration policy and practice in, in states such as um, California, New York, and Arizona. So I'm, I'm glad today, I think something really special about the TESOL organization is not only how diverse it is nationally, but internationally. And I already saw somebody here from Turkey and I haven't looked at the chat more, but so um, something that about Cynthia that I really admire is how bold she is in her job choices. Um, she doesn't just come into places that are established, she comes into established places and to established organizations. So she first started, you know, in New York, where if anyone's from California, there have been a lot of immigrant centers at universities, but unfortunately in New York City, that was not the case. And forget about New York State, right? That was definitely not the case. So Cynthia came in to start the Immigrant Student Success Center at John Jay College, which is one of our CUNY schools. And then with CUNY I, um, it was an idea, right, that was on five pages of paper. And Cynthia came to start the CUNY Initiative on Immigration and Education. So um, just jumping right into something brand new and not only jumping into something brand new, but something that um, we only had on the ground for three months and then we started a pandemic, right? So a brand new organization and a pandemic. So um, something I admire about Cynthia is she always um, comes from a place of equity and humanity and that leads everything she does. And it's really wonderful to work with her. And I think she's one of the most organized people I know. <laughs> So that's, I'm excited to do this presentation with Cynthia today. Thank you, Tatiana. <laughs> I appreciate the organized comments. I often don't think I'm organized, but then it, it does reflect in different ways. Uh, so I'll do the same. I'll introduce Tatiana Klein. So uh, to kind of get those specifics out of the way, Tatiana is an associate professor and the director of the bilingual education and TESOL programs at City College. And so that's where I met Tatiana. Uh, we both attended Teachers College, and so that was kind of like an immediate connection. But when I was thinking about your introduction, Tatiana, I was, and I was like looking at your bio, I felt like I was introducing a film director, um, because all so much of your work, I think, is film-based. So the ones that I'm most connected with is the, um, the Supporting Immigrants in Schools videos, which is what kind of began the CUNY-I project and developed into the modules, which we'll talk about later. But I'm also thinking about the two other 
um, documentaries and video series that you worked on, the Una Vida Dos Países and the Living Undocumented, that both focus, one focuses on kind of traveling back to, to Mexico and the other one focuses on what it means to be living undocumented in the United States. And so I was thinking, I was thinking about those when thinking about your introduction. Um, and because I think that's similar to what you said, that's something that I that I really value in the work that you do, which is you incorporate you incorporate visuals, you incorporate video, and you incorporate storytelling in a way that many academic spaces don't really in, in, interrogate or negotiate with when talking about this particular lived experience. Um, and so, yeah, I think I think when I think of those things, um, when I think of your work, I often think of those those video series. But in our in our like day to day interaction, I think I I really appreciate Tatiana in the work in CUNY that you're able to think of so many different things happening at the same time too. So I feel like both our minds are going at like a super speed pace and we're thinking of so many different things, trying to figure out how to include so many different voices and experiences in this work while also trying to navigate the bureaucracy and, and the, the, what's it called? Like the, the red tape of this kind of work that we often do in academic settings and in state settings and in city settings. Um, but yes, that's, that's Tatiana Klein in a very small nutshell. <laughs> Thank you. And we also have um, Ariana Mangua Figueroa, who's one of our um, co principal investigators, Nancy Stern, also a co principal investigator. And next year, I think this is the first time I'm saying this in public, but um, I am going on sabbatical. So, um, <laughs> so um, Rosa McCutcheon Rivera um, will be taking over as um, co principal investigator. So we have some shifts, but I'll be back and I'll be excited to see about the work that has happened um, in, the, in the interim. Um, but then we have, I don't, I don't remember the exact number, Cynthia, but it's about 30 something other members of CUNY I as well, right? I counted the numbers this morning and it's 45. Oh my God. Not goodness. including okay. the school leadership teams that are situated in the schools that we work with. So if we go to the next slide, we want to um, kind of tell you a little bit about, actually, we want to know where you are, right? We are both actually in New York City as, as we speak right now. So I saw some of you um, put, I see Turkey again, um, but please tell us where you are because we kind of want to know. Um, we see your boxes, <laughs> but we want to know at least where you're from and hopefully at the end, we can have a conversation face to face if people feel yeah. comfortable but definitely do um, write in and then we will um, keep going and let you know a little bit more about our 40 something team members. Um, so we have a short little video to introduce some of our larger team, which um, is a combination of faculty, doctoral students, um, educators um, across that, folks who are directly impacted, who have lived the migration experiences, those who teach about it, et cetera. It's quite an um, a amazing group. So we'll play the little video about who we are at CUNY I. Uh, did, um, um, do we want to give folks a little bit more time to write where they're coming? Oh, sure, from? sure. So let's see. We, I see um, Portland, Oregon, Capital Region. Is that Capital Region of New York? Um, Oh, oh, Clara, Clara um, summarized. Wow, I run. Oh, Turkey. so helpful. This is great. Yes, New York. Okay, great. We have a local here. Great. Great. Thank you so much, folks, for participating. So, like Tatiana said, we'll we'll I'll go ahead and show a video now to give a brief introduction of who CUNY includes and is involved. Hola, mi nombre es Glisset Colon. Y yo soy CUNY I. My name is Brian Mercado, and I am CUNY I. Ana es mi Anthony Hart, Juana CUNY I. Ana es mi Fala, Ana CUNY I. My name is Khadija Monet Martin, and I am CUNY I. Me llamo Lorena, y soy CUNY I. And if we had time, we would uh, show 40 more <laughs> of our faces, but we don't have time, but that's just a little bit about the faces behind the name. So um, the next thing I want to do is briefly just read Hola. to you um, our, our, um, our vision, right, which is what we strive to do and be in this work. So our vision, um, it, communities and schools are shaped and strengthened by the migration of people and ideas across the globe. The City University of New York Initiative on Immigration and Education, CUNY-I, creates opportunities for educational stakeholders to learn from immigrant students, families, and educators directly impacted by restrictive immigration policies and educational inequality. 
We aim to develop multimodal and multilingual resources that center the strengths of mixed status immigrant communities that are undocumented, refugee, and asylum seeking members. At CUNY, educators, researchers, families, and local leaders work together to learn about from and with immigrant communities, act in ways that center our shared humanity, regardless of legal status, and advocate for equitable policies and opportunities. And so what we'll do today is show you a little bit about the ways that we try to do that and the resources we've tried to, we have put together and we're continuing to put together to live out this vision. And so part of the ways in which we articulate the vision that we want that we want our work and our and the folks we work with to embody is through the grounding principles and i know zoom has kind of created this um maybe these spaces where we don't necessarily speak into into the space or into the zoom room but i'm going to encourage folks to read out loud uh with us the grounding principles what i'm going to do is first uh stop the screen share here and instead do a screen share for where the guiding principles are located. So this is our website. Um, we have our grounding principles listed here. And what I would like folks to do is to help us read out loud the grounding principles that are listed here. We'll get you all started. I'll have uh, Tatiana read the first grounding principle. Uh, one of our um, principal co-principal investigators has recorded the second grounding principle and I'll play that. I'll read the third and then we'll have folks uh, volunteer to, to read the other one. So I'll have Tatiana read the first one. Great. Black immigrant lives matter. CUNY I stands in solidarity with all those fighting for equity and justice in the black immigrant um, movement. It is therefore important to approach this work with a sense of solidarity in mind. Although Black immigrants make up the smallest percentage of immigrants in the United States, they are more likely to be targeted for deportation. By centering the lives and experiences of those who are most vulnerable, we can advocate for equity for everyone. I'm sorry, for equality for everyone. Perfect. Thank you, Tatiana. Now I'm gonna hope that you all can hear this. This will be the second grounding principle. New York State resides on lands stolen from native people. Lenape, Haudenosaunee, Mohican, Abenaki, Erie, Canarsie, Rockaway, Algonquin, Merrick, Massapequas, Matinecock, Nisiquag, Setauketz, Korchog, Sikatog, Unkachog, Shinnecock, Montauket, and Menansett. And so that's the latter part of our second grounding principle, no one is illegal on stolen land. We believe that no person should be defined in terms of their immigration status, and we are opposed to the dehumanization of anyone through the use of the term illegal. The notion is further complicated by the history of colonization in the United States. The third grounding principle, we are not all immigrants. The fabric of the US includes not only immigrants, but also Native Americans whose land was stolen in the creation of this country, as well as the descendants of enslaved people who were brought to this land against their will. We refrain from statements like, we are all immigrants, and this nation was built by immigrants, because this further invisibilizes the native peoples and lived realities of slavery and the black experience in the United States. Now, would anyone like to volunteer to read the next grounding principle? I know it's somebody's birthday in here today and I'm wondering if they would wanna read so we can wish them a happy birthday. <laughs> Whose birthday is it? It's my birthday. <laughs> 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 Thank you. <laughs> Thank you okay, so I'm birthday. gonna read. Uh, Happy birthday, Zhang Feng. Thank you. <laughs> nice to see you all here. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so the immigrant experience exists beyond the Latinx uh, uh, narrative. 
The rhetoric on immigrant rights in the United States often centers Latinx communities and, specific, uh, and specifically the Mexican experience. In fact, the immigrant experience in the US encompasses many countries, races, and ethnicities. As we seek to advocate for equitable opportunities for all immigrants in the New York context, it is vitally important to recognize and make space for immigrants outside the Latinx diaspora. Thank you so much and happy birthday. Thank you. <laughs> Would anyone like to volunteer to read the next grounding principle? I can read it. Hi, this is Lindsay. <laughs> um, all right, immigrants and students labeled as English language learners are not interchangeable. Approximately half of all multilingual learners in New York are US born, many of whom grew up in multilingual homes and require additional support to learn English via bilingual education or English as a new language ENL programs. In addition, many immigrants arrive from English speaking countries and or are already bilingual. Ideally, all students, and especially those who speak a home language other than English, will be given the opportunity to become bilingual and biliterate in school. It is important that we not conflate the two distinct though overlapping categories of students who are immigrant origin with students who are categorized as English language learners. Thank you so much. Uh, who would like to volunteer to read the next grounding principle? I can read. Hi, I'm Alexandria, sorry. <laughs> um, the immigration experience is complicated. Reasons for migrating to the US vary among individuals and families but leaving one's home, family, language, and culture is often traumatic. And even though some immigrants come to the US for economic opportunity, financial issues may continue to be a challenge for new immigrants. Nevertheless, mainstream rhetoric upholds the narrative that immigrants are happier to be in the US than in their home country. This perception is reinforced by messages extolling assimilation and patriotism. However, in addition to other challenges, immigrants are often treated like second-class citizens or denied citizenship altogether. Immigrants also experience violent laws and policing practices that often make the US a hostile space for immigrants. Perfect, thank you so much. Who would like to volunteer to read the next grounding principle? Hi, I'm Golar, I can read the next one. Thank you. Migration can be traumatic. Our work recognizes that the experience of migration through militarized borders can be difficult and painful. While there is a vibrant migration is beautiful movement often symbolized with the imagery of the butterfly. We must recognize that students and community members experiences with migration may have been traumatic. We wish to understand and recognize these experiences by incorporating mental health resources and socio-emotional support in our work. Thank you, Goli. Sounds like we're on a roll. Who's next? <laughs> I can do it. Xenophobia is systemic. Anti-immigrant discourse has blamed immigrants for a broken economy failing schools, and for overwhelmed medical resources. Research has continually shown that immigrants don't have a negative impact on any of these services. In fact, immigrants often provide a positive impact, both socially and economically. Immigrants are vilified because of xenophobia, much like racism is a systemic issue in the US. As a result, immigrant students often have less economic mobility attend under-resourced resourced schools and are provided with fewer social services. Thank you, Clara. Two more to go, who's next? I can read. Um, teaching through 
translanguaging is central. We believe the home language practices of immigrant origin students, which include different languages and varieties, are a strength that must be a part of their education. Translanguaging pedagogy, which deliberately integrates flexible language practices into education, allows for students' voices and learning opportunities across programs, content areas, and levels. All instruction should draw on students' many linguistic resources, regardless of whether they have been labeled as English language learners. Thank you so much. And last but not least, I can read. Thank you. Um, we aim to move beyond allyship to working as accomplices. Our work seeks to provide opportunities for educators to ed engage as allies and to move from ally work to accomplice work. An ally engaged in activism by standing with an individual or group in a marginalized community. An accomplice focuses on dismantling the structures that oppress that individual or group. And such work will be directed by stakeholders in the marginalized group. As we continue to educate, educate ourselves and others, our work seeks to develop a leadership while also addressing and changing structures that impact immigrant students and communities. Perfect. Thank you so much, everyone, for participating in that. I'm going to stop sharing the screen here, but you can find our grounding principles on our website. And I think the website has already been linked in the chat, but I'll put it here directly so you all can take, are able to take a look at it. Um, part of the grounding principles, partially the reason for the creation of the grounding principles is to help situate all of us on, on the same page on how we would like to work with immigrant students, how we would like to situate our knowledge in this kind of work and act in ways that, that center immigrant communities um, through everything that, that we do. And I think part of our like tagline is also learn, act and advocate. And so I'm sure part of what you may have heard today in the grounding principles might've been something you hadn't heard today, or maybe you hadn't heard it within this context. So part of what we're hoping to, to instill with folks with the grounding principles is this idea of learning of these multitude of experiences that our students bring, acting in ways that will support them and then continuing to advocate. And so part of the ways in which we do this is through just the different levels of the work that we engage with. And so we see here listed the different kinds of projects that CUNY I participates in. I'll be very brief in explaining what each of these are. And then if folks have questions, there's opportunity to have a larger conversation about that. Uh, we work with 11 partner schools uh, next year, hopefully 12. But we work with 11 partner schools all situated across New York State. So we have a, we have a school in Western New York a couple of schools in New York City, Long Island, the Hudson Valley, and we work, um, our team works with part with school leadership team members in, in each of these schools to understand what is the immigrant experience in the schools and to also create ways to address, support, um, and cultivate a sense of community with the immigrant community there. Uh, and so our work with the partner schools also connects with the data exchange that we're hoping to do. So we've, we've created surveys, focus groups, and interviews in which we're hoping to assess the needs of immigrant students in these spaces, and then also utilize that data to create a cohesive report specifically for the school so that the school is also able to gain some knowledge of their immigrant students of ways in which they can better support and advocate for their immigrant students in these spaces. We also have the professional development modules and these are the ones that we'll talk a little bit more about later today, but these professional development modules were created by community members, graduate students, uh, former administrators in, in school districts, uh, professors who wanted to utilize their knowledge on, on the immigrant experience and how to support immigrant students in K-12 spaces and created several different activities within these modules to better support uh, students in, the, in these spaces. There's four of them, they each cover different topics, but we'll talk about those in a little bit. We also have mini classes for CTLE credit. So this was an endeavor that we took on this past year where we were able to uh, host classes that provided CTLE credit for educators across New York State. 
And so the classes were directly tied to the module. So the work that you'll see in the modules and the topics that, you, that the modules cover are also covered in the CTLE classes. We're hoping to continue providing those next year. Um, they, they were really, they were such a big hit. They were really popular and they, can, they, can, they kept kind of selling out in, in availability. So we're hoping to also expand on that as well. Then we're also working with specifically a group of undocumented and documented educators and community educators to create the UndocuEDU group. So this group has also developed a video series that talks specifically about what is the undocumented student experience or the documented student experience in wanting to be a teacher, but not being able to because of um, the bureaucracy that's within the state that doesn't allow it because of immigration status and the ways in which fingerprinting is mandated for educators to, to become educators, how certification is also uh, delegated in this way. And so they're doing some, they're doing research related to, to those experiences and what are ways in which both our institutions of higher learning and the state itself can shift how they allow or who they allow to be teachers in these particular spaces while also highlighting the importance of immigrant and undocumented educators in our schools. And lastly, the immigrant liaison group. So with this, we work specifically with the New York State Youth Leadership Council. So this is an undocumented youth led organization in New York City. Uh, we're working with them and a subgroup of, of their um, projects called Teach Dream, which are educators that work specifically with undocumented students to provide kind of uh, similar to the resources that we're providing here, but situated within New York City schools. And so we work, we're working with them as they create immigrant liaison positions in two New York City high schools. So what are immigrant liaison positions? It's essentially an individual that are students and immigrant students and documented students know that they can reach out to, to ask for resources, to ask for support, uh, to help at, with advocacy. Um, we have a large immigrant population in New York City, but often uh, there isn't a specific person that can answer questions when, stu when students are experiencing uh, stress or anxiety related to their immigration status or a lack of resources in navigating the New York Dream Act, financial aid opportunities. And so this group is specifically creating those kind of resources and that kind of position. Uh, we're hoping that that can then be multiplied into different aspects of New York City, into different schools of New York City and New York State. Um, but this is the first year that they're doing it, so we'll see, we'll see the results from it um, in the future, hopefully. And so now we'll go ahead and jump into the modules. Thank you. I think now you can see why we have a team of 45 people, <laughs> because we're kind of in a lot of different things. One thing I, I, I'm um, forgot to share with you is how CUNY I came about and how it's funded, right? So um, as Cynthia said, I've been doing a lot of work with, um, with videos and film and multimodal work because I found as an academic that writing is important, but it's not enough, right? It's not enough to share the work that we do with, with different communities. So um, I did um, worked on these supporting immigrants in schools video series, one of which we're, you're going to see that New York State Education Department um, asked asked um to ask us to create and so after i did those they were able to identify funds and do something much larger um so we so i'm happy to say that you know in new york state like the state is behind this work the state understands the importance of this work and is putting their resources behind it so um some of you um probably especially in this space are familiar with cuny nicib so we often like to refer to ourselves as the cousin of cuny nicib there's um a lot of continuation in in, in the work and also in as you saw in the um, guiding principle around translanguaging as well. But what we want to share today is um, only one of the four videos. There's a key issues video, there's immigration in elementary and secondary schools, and then um, refugees and immigrants in schools. So we're going to share this video from um, an elementary school called Dos Puentes in Washington Heights. Um, some of you may have heard of it. Um, it oftentimes people say like, oh, five and six-year-olds and seven-year-olds are too young to talk about these issues or too young to understand them. So we want to show you um, a teacher who actually brings difficult issues into her classroom. Um, her name is Rebecca Madrigal and, um, and, and how it can be done. And uh, something I want to 
say ahead of time is this was filmed during the Trump administration when you know very difficult things were happening. Um, but that is not to say that now that we have a new administration, everything is all well and good, right? ICE is still working, deportations are still happening. There's a lot of very traumatic things going on um, with immigrant communities across the country. So I just want to preface it with that that yes, we're in a different space, but we still need to, we cannot relax and, and the advocacy um, needs to continue. So we'll go ahead and play it. It's a 12 12-minute video. So to, to again kind of walk you folks to so you can identify where the video is located, this is our website. We have the our work supporting immigrants in schools and the key immigrant issues video is located here. So I'll go ahead and play it and make it full screen. Say your name and then I go to International School 45 in another language. Wouldn't that be cool? Okay. Uh, this is not the, this is, oh, did I play the wrong, oh, oops, I played the immigrant issues video. But it's okay, now you know where to no. find it. <laughs> there we go. Thank you. Hola, la cámara uno. Hola. A la cámara dos. Hola. Al micrófono. Buenos días, ¿cómo están chicos? Just, un poquito cansado, yo sé, yo sé. So I decided to read the book El Muro. El Muro stands for the wall. And I think it was very relevant to the current events in a fiction way. Los habitantes de la nueva casa son los Blanc. La familia Blanc son papá Blanc. Mamá Blon, David Blon y el perro Blonco. La familia Blin mira con mucha atención. Mira qué raros son, dice papá Blin. Papá Blin no se siente muy seguro. Decide entonces construir un muro entre las dos casas. Can you tell me why you teach about current immigration issues to your students? It's part of the life. It's not something that we want to hide or that we don't feel comfortable talking about. They have trust in the teachers, in the classroom, and they feel open to speak about those conversations, especially in first grade, you know, our topic is family and community. Piensa, así estaremos más tranquilos. Son tan diferentes de nosotros. They haven't even tried to be friends with them. Dí poco más sobre eso, Felix. They don't even know each other. They don't even know if they like each other. Y construyeron un muro. ¿Verdad? Mm -hmm. And they're smart enough to build a ladder. Boys and girls, so what is the message in this book for us? Cuando tú le ves a alguien, a alguien y, solo, y, no, y no le has decidido hola, no, le, no, no inmediatamente haces cosas que, que ni sabes si son necesarias. Porque mm -hmm. en, cuando Génesis primero vino, yo no, sé, yo no me sentí tan, tan um, seguro, pero ahora soy amiga con ella. They see the newspapers, they see the TV, they hear the parents talking about those, those events. Estamos levantando un muro para que las familias no pasen, ¿verdad? A los Estados Unidos. ¿Qué podemos hablar sobre eso? Maybe um, el presidente no quiere ver como personas cruzando porque él piensa que ellos son mucho dif mucho más diferente que nosotros y él no quiere ver a esas personas solo si cruzan un avión pero en realidad no es nada solo son humanos como él es como somos todos nosotros son ¿verdad? los que ellos saben inglés y ellos y los que cruzan el muro son um, son españoles hablan español hablan español something that I like to do is use or choose 
authentic literature to support that those conversations and for the children to see themselves well i'm not the only one in this position alguien puede pensar en su propia familia por qué su familia vino aquí because much like money costs for a lot and and in new york um, the money costs a little less than russia a little my mom um lived in ecuador then she came over here then she said and my dad and then she decided to stay here to have a better life with my dad you shared a little bit about your you know your family came here as well from mexico but you didn't state any of your beliefs how do you kind of separate that and what do you do it's important for the children to know where i'm from and i feel proud so i want them to feel the same way about their country a way that they can do is through literature right here we have marisol mcdonald and the class bash this is about a Peruvian child. Her birthday wish is for her abuelita to come to her birthday, but the abuelita doesn't have papers. Mama's Life Tell Girl is a Haitian story about a mom who is already in a detention center. And it's about Saja, who is the girl, who is really, um, she's suffering that separation. And, and I think now what we see in current events it's about the separation and, and the children that talk about it. How much damage can be done by a child when they're separated from the parents? When the children, they come and they enter those puentes, we, commit to make a home visit to a new student coming. This is where we, you know, we have a little window, like how, what are the needs that they have or what are the strengths of the family. Sometimes we know like undocumented immigrants are all scared to come to school. This is, so how do you feel like this home visit impact families who may be undocumented? Right. I think at the beginning when we were doing it, it was like, a, why, why are you coming to our home? But I think we have established ourselves in the community. I'm an immigrant, uh, undocumented immigrant. My overstay my visa, and um, I have two children born in New York. Uh, one is eight and five, and they are very happy children. They enjoy school. They're very active. They're bilingual. Something is very important for me and my wife, and I'm the only undocumented immigrant in the family. They will come and leave their children in the school. It would, it would take them a long time to leave that gate, to leave that door, because we didn't know that when maybe that was the last time they would, they would see the children. How does the school support your immigrant families, especially those which may be undocumented? You don't know, you know some, you don't know others. So the first thing that we did was to bring in experts and to speak to the parents. The PA is the parent association. The PA was very active. And they brought um, immigration organizations to speak to the parents. I went to those events to show that we're in solidarity with them. It was a very surprise for me. And uh, after the election in November, on Sunday, then, uh, we find uh, flyers in the backpack for my kids. You no, know, it was amazing to find out it's not only for Latinos, uh, it was sent to everyone. And uh, it kind of was supportive for us, for everybody, because we provide a list of services that the district can help. So what's it like to be an undocumented immigrant to school going children in, in the United States, especially when everything is becoming more and more anti-immigrant? It's uh, very sad. It's like uh, I'm driving a car because when I run out of gas, but uh, seeing uh, my children and their love and kind of recharge and keep going. Sí. 
si me separan, tal vez no voy a ver, no, verlos otra vez, pero si no, um, yo puedo verlos mucho. ¿Verdad? Y separarte de tu, de tu gemelo sería el libro de, devastador, ¿verdad? Devastador. See, we're very diverse. We have children from Brazil, Chile, Ecuador, United States, Guatemala, Honduras, Dominican Republic, and Mexico, most, Puerto oh, Rico. No. DR and, and the United States is the most, but then Mexico. Right. And then Mexico, yeah. But then it's so oh, diverse. Hi. 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 But then Russia yeah, and Korea, Korea, Korea Nicaragua. And so that is one of the videos that are listed on our website. Let me go back to sharing the screen so I can walk us through some of the other ones. And so like Tatiana mentioned, these are the videos that began this project. There's key immigrant issues, refugees and immigrants in schools, the, the immigration and elementary schools one we just watched, and then immigration in secondary schools. And so what accompanied each of these uh, videos, which was created in the first year of the CUNY I um, project is the comprehensive educator module. So if you go on our website, we also have them listed here. Um, oh, it didn't load. Let me try refreshing that. Oh. Um, so we have some of the modules, we have all the modules listed here and each of them has a brief description of what it'll be covering as well as the themes that each of the top each of the modules cover and so if there's something specific maybe to your um to your grade level so there's elementary schools secondary schools specific to the group of students that you're working with so if you work in a school that has more refugee students the refugee module will be really helpful if you're interested in just kind of beginning to have these conversations on immigration not only with your students but with your colleagues the key immigrant issues module would be a really helpful module to get you situated. All you have to do is download it here and it pops up. And so how this kind of how this kind of works is, <clears throat> excuse me, we have a couple of kind of introductory notes that you can read through when, when you have time. Um, a brief um, showcasing of who was involved in these projects and a table of contents. So we have several activities and each of these activities is accompanied by different handouts, documents, something that you can easily print out or email so that your so folks can participate, they can work on it with you, they can uh, do it over Zoom. And so the one that is particularly helpful, well, whenever I, whenever I uh, talk to folks about this module is activity four. So what do we know about history of immigration in the US, a timeline? So it walks you through how long it'll probably take if you need to be well versed in immigration issues to cover this or if you can just be kind of a beginner in engaging with this and who it's targeted to so educators or students, a brief overview and what are the goals situated with this. There's also some terminology attached. Uh, we have a glossary that I'll go over in just a bit, but the uh, terminology is also listed here and referenced in the glossary document. Then there's accompanying materials that are available to, to utilize while doing this activity, as well as the procedure itself of what you would need to do to engage with this conversation. So this particular uh, activity talks about going through the timeline of immigration history in the United States, having folks really um, address what are ways in which policies, super uh, Supreme Court decisions were made, the way in which um, there has been repercussions to specific community members on so company minors and schools and allowing for folks to discuss what this kind of timeline really looks like and what are ways in which uh, folks can see that being replicated in their schools. The handouts themselves provide a, a brief guide of, of what this would look like in, in real life. So in this particular example, there are immigra immigration event cards. So you would print this out, cut it out, Folks would put them in order of when they occurred. Um, and folks are also learning about the ways in which different immigration policies have been consistent throughout our history, right? It's not, it's not anything that Donald Trump invented. 
it has been in existence since the 1700s. It has been in existence since the 1800s. Um, it goes as far back as impacting specifically different groups of people. So for here, we see uh, people of color, but specifically Haitian immigrants. We see the impact on Native Americans. We see the impact, um, there was another one here I wanted to highlight, the um, Chinese in particular. So, so the history of immigration um, is really consolidated in a way for folks to, to engage with this topic um, while still being able to talk to their colleagues about how this looks like in their spaces, talk to their students about how this is replicating in, in current events. And so each of these activities and the subsequent handouts or guides are in the appendix. And so you're able to utilize any of these activities for your classroom. And like I said, we have four of them situated here that folks can engage with. And we also have a glossary. So even the glossary can be a standalone activity really for folks to use in case they want to just talk about different kinds of terminology that folks might not be familiar with. Uh, it's really helpful to, to get this information um, to folks early on so that they're able to identify some terminologies. Whenever I've provided these kind of presentations, we tend to get stuck in terminology. So folks will ask like, what are the specific requirements of DACA or what is SIG or what's the difference between a refugee and an asylum seeker? And so this document is really helpful to, to get those conversations situated and then move forward with the, the, um, the crux of the conversation that we're hoping folks will have with these modules. And yeah, they're listed here on our website for folks to use um, and they're, av they're available to 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 use to download to to make any edits that you would like us to to also make and so what we want folks to do now is give you all five minutes to go through the website did you want to say something first tatiana tatiana I, you're muted i was like for a second i was like is that me like am i <laughs> no, I was just since we only have nine minutes left, I was just thinking uh -huh. if we wanted to just jump into the, the Q&A and people could yeah, maybe great. look at the website while we're talking. Yes, I think that's a great idea. Yes. Let's do that. Um, so any thoughts or questions or ideas people want to share or connections, we'd love to hear that too. There's one question by Ozen. Um, how would you describe the overall purpose of your work, equitable education? I think um, when Cynthia talked about our tagline to learn, act and advocate, I think that is, you know, one of the purposes of the work and, 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 and who does the learning and the acting and advocating is, is multi layered right so it's educators it's immigrants. Some of who are um, are the educators too. It's students, right? It's families. So all of us coming together to learn. It's kind of, kind of like summarizing our vision. But I think that's what we want to do. We want to push um, how we teach about immigration, how immigrants um, are included in in education educational spaces, and we want to also change policies so we can have more people that look like our students with similar experiences in classrooms as teachers, as administrators, as superintendents, etc. Sorry. I think something we also are hoping by sharing these resources is that they will make their way into uh, into spaces in academia, especially in teacher education um, programs, because um, I don't know about you, but I never had a class on immigration and education, right? It kind of came up here and there. So what we're hoping with these resources is they allow people to start from a place of building depth around this kind of knowledge and not just skim over it um, without really um, in-depth understandings and then go into classrooms and not feel prepared to speak about, teach about, and support students and families and learn, continue to learn as well. Yes, um, Tatiana, I wanted to say, I said it, I'm sharing a little bit on Twitter if anyone wants to share, even an afterthought after this uh, on Twitter. Uh, there is a conversation and people are really talking about the principles, how they think. So John Feng said, no, we should center these principles in our, in our programs, our teacher education programs. 
And I agree. And I also wanted to say that I've used your movies, these clips with my students and they have been so helpful because they are obviously very well made and, and, and we need to hear and visualize the experience and also see uh, ex positive examples, you know, of uh, uh, because people always say, okay, you are saying this, but how do we do it, right? Teacher education programs is, we always get that question. Yes. How do you do it? And then I feel that the videos and the resources are really, um, they really get to that question really well. Uh, so we can move past that and reflect and go to how would you do it, right? And, and why, right? So something else that we're, and maybe Cynthia wants to talk a little bit about this is more about the how we do it is with our work with our partner schools next year and the inquiry project. So we're hoping to learn a lot more about the how. I don't know if we, I mean, we're still figuring it out, but. Yeah, I, I won't get too into it because I think it, it'll turn into a whole lecture. Right, right. <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're utilizing what Eve and Tuck um, called a problem tree, but we're, we're talking about a kind of an inquiry tree format um, where at the root is systemic problems, right? So it's, it's um, racism, it's xenophobia, it's sexism, it's homophobia, it's classism, and all of that goes into the trunk of a tree um, which creates different situations in which students are either not being welcomed into spaces, um, educators who are undocumented are also not being welcome to being teachers. Uh, the brunt of the work is placed onto teachers of color in a lot of these spaces. And then those manifest into the leagues, right? And then that's when we're seeing very specific examples. So we're seeing um, uh, teacher burnout at, at higher rates for educators of color. We're seeing um, students being scared of coming to school because of ICE presence that may have that may be situated in some of these schools or police presence that, that is situated in these schools. And so we're using kind of this metaphor to have folks in our partner schools engage with these, um, with the ways in which these issues manifest in their spaces and then getting at the root of the conversation. Because I think often um, we'll place kind of a blanket idea of, of what is happening in schools, why they're like, blame the president when Trump was in administration to say, oh, Trump is doing all this. Um, or we'll say like, oh, well, parents are like not, parents are working, so they're, they're too busy, so they don't, they, they can't come and engage with their students. But there's so many other kind of smaller ways in which these things manifest that explain other things that are going around um, to show really what is, at, what, is at the, what is at the core of this, not just what is the symptom of it. Um, and so, so yeah, so that's what we're doing with the, with the SLTs without me going too much into detail about that. Can I ask another question? Sure. First of all, thank you so much. I mean, that was really, it was really refreshing to see that um, the, the connection between immigration and education in the US context isn't only from the angle of language learning, but actually there are very important other dimensions to that. And it was really refreshing to see that you're actually focusing on that. And I, I really appreciated it. And the website, certainly I will be looking in more detail. It is so interesting to me. And I just wanted to ask um, just one clarification question. In terms of your modules, do you only provide those modules to the schools or do you also provide some kind of training in those modules? And my second question, do you have a research um, dimension to that process evaluating the impact of your work? Yeah. Uh, maybe I'll take the modules and Cynthia can take the research. So with the modules, we actually have three levels that we, we work with. So one is with our 11 partner schools and some schools we're providing, like we, you know, we're um, facilitating the modules with, with the educators and, you know, others in the school. Um, what we, we do offer for, cause 11 schools is, you know, the reach is very limited, right? So we do offer it for New York state educators, CTLE, like mini classes where teachers get credit, you know, for continuing education. So we offer those, but we know that, okay, that's a larger reach, but we can't reach everybody. So what we do is we keep them on the website for people beyond New York state, right. To kind of pick, and hopefully there's somebody in the school that 
they don't have to be an expert, but you know, to, willing to take on the effort to learn more and then to co facilitate to facilitate those modules. So we see them working at different levels. Um, of course, we'd love to be in schools and in dialogue, but it's just not re it's not possible. So we we kind of trying to address them as as many ways as possible. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Ozen. Um, with regards to the research question, that's something that we're really hoping to implement a lot more next year. Um, the IRB process is was much longer than we had anticipated or had predicted. And so now that we're kind of situated with that, we, like I mentioned, we created uh, protocols for interviews, focus groups, and surveys for students, parents, and educators. And for the students, it's like situated in different age groups. Um, so we utilize either like uh, visual depictions or auditory or different ways in which students would be able to answer similar questions across different age ranges. And so we're really hoping um, that with this particular tool, we're able to assess both what is the needs of the schools that we're working with. And I think in some ways, because we'll be specifically working with the partner schools to, to, um, to implement these research tools, that we'll be able to incorporate and assess what are ways in which our involvement has or hasn't been helpful or has or hasn't situated um, additional learning for educators. I think because our direct line of contact is not students and it's not parents in this kind of work, those research protocols will more so answer different questions about what are the needs, what are ways in which you are or aren't being incorporated in the conversation. And then for educators, that'll connect a little bit more with some of, our, some of the tools that we've been able to provide. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. I know we're, we're out of time, right? I, I do want to share with folks just very briefly. Uh, we're starting the... five minutes past, Cynthia, so maybe we can go until 5.05, 5, 4 oh, 5. <laughs> Excellent, yes, that'd be perfect. So I'll talk very briefly about the workshop series so that folks can, can also participate in that. So we have a, a monthly workshop series where some of our team members create opportunities to have conversations at the intersection of immigration and education. In the past, we've talked about legal updates, we've talked about UndocuArt, and this Thursday, so a day from now, today's <laughs> this Thursday, we'll be talking about organizing at the intersection of immigration and education. And so this particular workshop is gonna bring together folks from different parts of New York and from different experiences in New York to talk about what it means to organize at this intersection. So I appreciate folks kind of pointing out that there isn't a lot of conversation at the intersection of immigration and education, but it's primarily in academic spaces where that conversation hasn't existed. In organizing spaces, it's been in existence, right? So we're seeing um, Jaime from IM schools will be talking a little bit about that intersection as someone who was formerly undocumented, someone who's in, who was a formerly undocumented educator. Gabby or Gabriela will be talking about the, um, the organizing that folks are doing in the New York State Youth Leadership Council as it relates to intersection and immigration. They created a um, UndocU Scholar Academy where they, uh, in, they bring in juniors and seniors across New York City to walk them through the process of how to apply for college, uh, how to apply for the New York Dream Act, which is often not something that our educators are informed in or trained on, or even higher ed educators, educators are not informed or trained on. Um, Darnell from um, Blambang One Haitian Literacy Project will also be talking about organizing at the intersection of immigration, specifically with a focus on Haitian immigrants, which is often not a, a community that is um, that is incorporated in mainstream conversations about this topic. And Simra Din will be talking from Ray's, um, that's revolutionizing Asian immigrant, um, I don't remember the other, the other, oh, oh, it's here, revolutionizing <laughs> American immigrant stories on the East Coast. And so um, Sinrod will also kind of be talking similarly about narratives that aren't being incorporated in this kind of organizing work. Ray's has also done really inspiring work at the intersection of art, immigration, and education. They released a zine a couple years ago, specifically highlighted undocumented Asian women's experiences in the United States and in education, specifically in New York City. Um, so we're really excited for this conversation. I think it's it's bringing in folks from different parts of this of this narrative to come and talk together about these these experiences and this kind of work that has been happening for years. I mean that the New York Dream Act passed is because of organizing done by these folks. And so if you're interested in attending, please uh, sign up in the the URL that's listed here in the bitly that's listed here. Um, I'll try and put it in the chat before we close out, but 
if you if you will, we will I think we will, we will be recording it. I think we're waiting for confirmation from two more folks. But if you're able to attend, please please join us. And like I mentioned, we do have one every month, so we'll have another one in June on fostering conversations across borders. So we'll be inviting folks. Um, I think we have a Guatemalan organization group that is also at the intersection of immigration and education that will also be joining us for for a conversation. Great, and I just put the link in the chat. So. Oh, excellent, yes, if you wanna put the link, so please feel, please register. We've already sent a reminder yesterday, but the, an hour before we'll be sending a Zoom link to everyone who's registered. Yeah. Oh wait, do you wanna share our social media? Oh yeah. yes, that's the next one. And then we have social We're everywhere. <laughs> We're everywhere. So we have Facebook, uh, we have Instagram, and we have Twitter. Uh, Please follow us for updates. We have a fantastic social media manager, Tashi, who constantly creates content for, for all of our platforms. Um, so please follow, engage, share with your friends, your colleagues, so that they can also get involved in this, in this conversation. And that's it for our presentation. Uh, thank you so much. What a wonderful work. I think that um, it connects so much with everything that we are doing together. And I agree with Ozen that sometimes the focus is too much on language, but there are so many other uh, important areas that we have to focus to have our students succeed and be happier, right? Where they are and, and, and feel, feel that they belong. Mm -hmm. So thank you so much, uh, Cynthia and Tatiana. And thank you everyone for coming. And stay tuned for more conversations and continue the conversations on Twitter so that we can bring together and continue the dialogue. Yes. Nelly, thank you everyone for joining and we look forward to seeing you at workshops or on Twitter or wherever you are. It's great to be in conversation. Thank you everyone. Thank you so much. Hi, Amber. Hi. <laughs> so Amber and I are working on on the the webinar. So um, great. I mean, it's all Clara. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we're so happy that you are here, and we are trying to make it more dialogical, including more people. And so, anyway, let's share it a little bit. So let's see what happens. I'll tag you. I tagged you, but I didn't tag CUNY High. Oh my gosh, I have to learn. <laughs> Always tag everything. <laughs> when you have the video, tag us and we'll share the video. So I think okay. that's you know. Okay, perfect. So, yeah. Sarah, I did I did see that um that you misspelled CUNY I. So it's double I, oh, not double E. Okay, okay. So maybe that was it. That might have that might have been why we weren't able to tag us, but it's mm -hmm. okay. Oh no, okay. We'll, we'll make it happen. Yay. Yeah, yeah. I am still learning about this because oh. social media is so is so intricate right there's so many different things but i think we're getting there and yeah. it's so important because yeah. i think we need that like we need that space to share and uh no, yeah and i'm I, so happy i'm yeah. so happy this happened and i feel so proud of you for this work oh, i know it's not easy to set up an institute like that <laughs> like wow i'm yeah. so impressed i it's was gonna say Clara. I, I was gonna say, and like, I I know you were probably doing Twitter while also managing this, while also doing like. I also I feel that you're like multitasking. Don't don't worry about it. I'm glad. I'm glad. No, don't worry. I want to promote right and yes. get people to think about it. That, that also beyond the space, so that yeah. I think the work gets promoted. And I also was I I took some screenshots and I the saw. Programs. I saw. You're fast. You're fast. Wow. <laughs> So that, so that people hear about it and the principles are amazing. So I think oh, that, yeah. Um, yeah, so amazing. I'm already thinking a lot about, because uh, I'm, I'm using your video. So I'm thinking, oh, I have to include these modules still. And then, because now it's online, I think everything's so much more, the way we can use these materials is so much more meaningful. Yeah. Yeah. You, you can set it up in your online digital space and you can have conversations about it that don't depend on the classroom environment, physical classroom environment necessarily. And I think they become so much more powerful. Yeah, I know it's interesting because we didn't create them for virtual spaces. You know, it was towards the end. We're like, wait, should we add like a Padlet or something, right? But we found that some of the activities actually work better in virtual spaces. I mean, I don't think, I don't think we can say that across the board, but there, but there, are, there are some benefits to it. So for sure.
for sure. I am very thankful because it's hard to find right good good materials uh, that are really thoughtful and 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 I think language wise too that for example the the person brought a really good point if we're teaching um, uh, a class on English language learners that I do we are trying to shift a little bit to culturally responsive education things like that and it's hard to find materials that that will open up their minds to more right than just the the typical frameworks that we use so I think uh, I'm very appreciative no Thank you for making the space and for inviting us. It was great. And we'll, we'll definitely stay in touch. And I know. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. And see you thank soon. You. Have a good Bye. end of the week and weekend. And thank you, Amber, for coming to. Was I see you, me. by the way. <laughs> we met what? online. So. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Bye.